having preferences is having this ordering of thoughts going on. Yeah. It's a sure sign. Yeah. If I've got preferences, then I'm ordering my thoughts yeah. and ranking. And this can seem to be uh, very overwhelming. Uh, it can seem to be like, well, now I know this is too big of a job for me. <laughs> God, we better work on this person over here. Because preferences... They run so deep. They run right down to the core of this personhood idea. Um, for for every person, there seems to be an enormous number of preferences and likes and, and dislikes. And it's even encouraged, you know, to be unique and be individual and, you know, to have your... Know what you like. Know what you like. And know, know what, what you want. Don't want. Know what you don't want and, you know, be clear. And and this this at this point we could say that it's truly important to focus on forgiveness, to focus on that one intent, to focus on um, watching the thoughts and, and, and slowly pulling away from them, investing in them, but, but that the joy of, of following the Holy Spirit as these thoughts become unordered, so to speak, um, undone, that the constructed order becomes undone, that this is a process of following the joy, following the joy in, and the joy of connecting, and the joy of that comes from not judging, is so strong and so intense that these preferences fade away. That the temptation, of course, hearing that these preferences are, are all part of the ego um, concept would be to go, all right, I'm going to stop this instant, um, make it with all these preferences, and. That can there can be some level confusion in there if you start trying to change the form, and for instance, um, quit your preference for smoking or for coffee or whatever, without having the mind sh shift on the inside, without following the joy and then allowing these preferences and desires to fade, as the mind gets focused on its one function. Without this, then the level confusion can creep in and. We're back to changing behaviors and without changing the, the mind, letting go of the false belief. The question that came to my mind before when you were speaking of, um, you know, the fact that this body is not immortal, that the ego, I think, would love, it, love to have me believe that it could be. And, um, and there, there is, the, is the belief that the body can be immortal. I can remember believing it. Yeah. I can remember very much like being very excited about that whole idea that the body is immortal. And it seemed very logical to me when I was learning about this that that, that in fact is the case, that it's only the mind's belief that it's not immortal that would have it die. Yeah. Well, if we take it, really string it out, I mean, the ego is for something that's nothing. It has a very much the illusion of being very ingenious, um, and that's certainly the experience in the world. It, uh, it seems to have made up a, a, a world, a, a, a giant cosmos, uh, a, apart from, from spirit, and apart from abstract uh, union, and it seems to have great diversity, great divide, variety. There seems to be great amounts of different skills. Um, many different choices and menus and, and to pick from. And it's, it's in the sense of projection, it now it's in, part of the projection is, you know, we have uh, televisions and video camcorders and VCRs, and, and it's like making movies within movies. Uh, the movie of the world is one movie, and then within the movie of the world, we, we have another projection. It just con the fragmentation continues and just seeming smaller in pieces. But the one thing that the ego has tried to come up with, has tried to answer, uh, be an answer to heaven, is uh, the characteristic or the ideal of immortality. And it has, and of course never will be able to, uh, to mimic or to uh, create immortality. Because immortality is uh, an attribute of of God and of creation, and the ego is 
uh, a defense against that is literally a puff of nothingness that did not come from God, that is not immortal. The ego seemed to have a beginning, and it will seem to have an end. <laughs> but this is all within the fabric or the framework of the dream. So the ego has never been able to uh, to come up with an immortality, to develop immortality. But it doesn't um, stop it from at least having the idea of immortality, of, of the idea that the body can be made to live forever. And once again, if the body is form, and if you, you know, form and um, spirit have no reconciliation, have no meeting point. One spirit exists, and form and time and space do not exist. So, and the very nature of form is that it's finite. Yes. That it's not eternal. It yes. cannot, therefore, be immortal. It has boundaries. It has boundaries. <laughs> has every, limits. every form has boundaries and limits, and, and God and creation do not. I remember um, one of the things I learned about at that time was... Uh, about this person, Babaji, in India, I believe. And he seemed to be proof for the fact that the body is immortal because it seemed that he, um, you know, he'd be around for periods of time and he would dematerialize and would not be around for periods of time. And then he would rematerialize and stay for a while and then dematerialize. And, and I suppose this has been going on for quite some time now. Mm -hmm. And that seemed to be proof that, you know, you don't have to die. That the body can be immortal if it's held in the mind that way. Mm -hmm. Just to perceive a body or a vision, though, it gets back to uh, perception in the sense that this can be a symbol for many. It can be a very comforting symbol. And it can be a symbol as... Uh, in a sense, is a symbol of teaching. Um, that those who have completely laid aside the body, their thoughts are always available um, to, to the deceived mind as, as part of help, and their vision may appear um, from time to time if that would be helpful. If this is something that um, obviously the Holy Spirit can, can reach the deceived mind in many, many ways, and these are nothing more than symbols of um, seeing the, the Virgin Mary in the, the Catholic tradition over in uh, Montegori. And, and, you know, these are more examples of uh, visions that can be seen that, that can be helpful, but still are perceptions. Okay. So you say it's still perceptual, so it's still unreal. It's yes. just that it's helpful, and yes. it's reaching the mind where it is. Yes, yes. It, the, the error would be to make the connection that you were doing because it seems to have been around for a long time that it seems to to be immortal. And once again, it, it, the knowledge or the kingdom of heaven is purely abstract, is, is light, not light like the uh, body's eyes see, but light in the sense of understanding and wisdom. And, uh, and darkness being a metaphor in a sense for ignorance, for... Uh, the blockage uh, of not aware of that light. So this knowledge and, and the kingdom are abstract and, and any kind of perception, however um, pure, however stabilized the perception becomes, it still is not knowledge, not the abstract kingdom, still perceptual and, and, and temporary and will not last. To, to finish up on a point about uh, the ego uses the body for pride, for pleasure, and for attack, um, all, they're all the same. I mean, you could say they're all, pride and pleasure um, are seeming forms of, of attack. I mean, it, the mind that, that is, um, believes that it is um, ego, believe, has identified with the ego, that is where the uh, those, that is an attack thought. That is an attack on the Christ within that mind. Even though it has no basis in reality, it's a, it's given reality by the, the mind's acceptance 
of that thought in, in that framework it, to the mind. It seems real. And all these uses of the body, whether we talk about for pride or recognition, the personal self, or for pleasure and pain and so on and so forth, that this is all um, the attraction of guilt this is all a way of concealing that the belief in the mind, the belief in separation and keeping the mind distracted on the screen and everything. So in that sense, um, they're all, it comes down to attack thoughts that, uh, you know, the body, uh, the uses that the ego puts to the body, this, this is all part of attack thoughts. Now, if we pull it back to the ultimate sense, to the right-minded perception, the mind cannot attack. That, that these thoughts are unreal thoughts, even these thoughts that are called attack thoughts in the workbook, are unreal thoughts. These are thoughts that have not come from the mind of God. They do not exist. Only the thoughts that come from God have existed. So to speak of attack thoughts is just a manner of speaking, as it were. Yes, that they are, they are unreal. Mm -hmm. And a mind that is invested in them is deceived and will experience the hallucination of pain and upset and despair and sorrow and depression and so forth, fear, because it has invested in, in thoughts in a thought system that, that does not come from God. So once again, the, the right mind sees that attack is literally impossible. It sees the false as false. It is not invested in these thoughts. It sees them as false and knows them as false. And this is no different than saying that the Holy Spirit you know, sees the, the false ideas or the false beliefs, but looks to the altar looks to the atonement, looks to the undefiled altar, and is certain uh, of, the, of, the, of the Christ, always looks to the Christ. So this is an example of, of, in a sense, coming full circle to your question about sickness, of why sickness is impossible. The mind cannot attack. The mind is whole, and the mind cannot attack. It can make up fantasies, and it can it can direct the body to act out fantasies, but the mind cannot attack. And and it would have to attack in order for a sickness to be a reality. Yes. <coughs> yes. And the right mind, the right mind knows that the mind cannot attack. The Holy Spirit knows that attack literally is impossible. That the ego is is an impossible thought, that all of the ego thoughts are impossible thoughts and unreal. So it's anchored in that. So in a sense, there's a, a part in the Course that, that as a reminder when one believes one is sick or so forth, is that I am not a body and my mind cannot attack, so I cannot be sick. That if there is no identification with the body and it's recognized and it's clearly understood that the mind cannot attack, then with those two conditions, there is no um, justification for guilt. There is no attack. There is no body with which to identify with or attack with, so to speak. And therefore, the conditions of peace have been met because the conditions of, of guilt um, are, n are no longer in place. If I believe that I am a body, or I believe that I am in a body, and I believe that my mind, or even my body, can attack, and that attack is real, then guilt must follow, and guilt must be justified. So you can see we're, we're working back to the right mind and, and being miracle-minded and staying in the right mind um, brings about automatically uh, inner peace. We've talked before about, um, in addition to perceiving my body as sick, I can perceive the body of another as sick. 
but in either case, it's just an indication that